want to welcome everybody who's just joined us. We All right, well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carrie Sonmar with the Battered Women's Justice Project, and I'm here today to assist NCDBW with their first webinar. Um, congratulations, I'm excited for you all to be here today. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to briefly go over some of the logistics for today's webinar. If you are disconnected from the webinar at any time, just go back to that original email and click on the link again to log back on. If you have any problems rejoining, you can call iLink Support, and they're great at helping um, any technical problems. If you can't rejoin, you can reach them at 1-800-799-4510. And I just typed that into the chat box for all of you as well. You can find this chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. To use this, just put your cursor all the way at the bottom white rectangle, left-click, enter your text, and then hit the Enter key on your keyboard to submit your text. All participants are muted throughout the whole webinar, so please use this chat feature for any questions, problems, or comments that you may have. If you do run into any technical problems, I ask if you could please send me a private chat and I'll help you um, get that worked out. To send me a private chat, click on the private tab that's inside that chat box. It's gray, but you can click on it. Find my name, which again is Carrie Sonmore. Double click on my name and then a box will open up for you to send me a private chat. Why don't we all go ahead and try out the public chat just so we can make sure we know how to use that. So if everybody could let us know where you're joining us from today, and if you have a group of folks with you, if you could let us know how many people are with you, that would be great. So just enter that into the chat box now. All right. And then for anybody who's only on the audio portion today, you can still join in with any questions. Just go ahead and send me an email and I'll make sure to get those questions over to Sue and Stephanie today. And my email is ksonmore at bwjp.org. And that's S as in Sam, O, N as in Nancy, M as in Mary, O, R, E, at bwjp.org. We are recording the webinar today, and you'll be able to access this on our website in about a week. And I believe, um, Sue, you guys will have this on your website at some point as well, correct? That's correct. Okay, great. Um, also, um, we will send out an email to all of you shortly after the webinar takes place today. It will contain a confirmation um, of your attendance. It will have a link to our um, recordings that are posted. And it will also have a brief survey for you all. And we greatly appreciate any feedback that you could give us. Um, before I send it over to Sue, I just have a few questions for all of you. It would be great if we could um, get some feedback from each one of you. Your questions are really helpful to us. So the first one I'm going to ask here is how do you describe your profession? And that pull up for you, Sue? Polling, yes. Okay, sometimes it takes a minute. So go ahead and click the radial button next to your choice. So how do you describe your profession? Community-based advocate, coalition staff, and or national PA provider, reentry specialist, staff at jail or prison, or DOC Department of Corrections staff, researcher professor, professor, or other. And if you are other, you can go ahead and type that into the chat box. And I'll just give everybody a moment to answer that. And again, just click the button next to your choice. Right up All there right. under the green, under the question, if you can just select the button and not write it in the public chat, that would be great. Okay, so I think I'll close that one out now. So um, you should see the results. We have 23% for community-based advocates. Oh, and even higher is the others, so a lot of other people who are typing their answer into the chat. 10% um, staff at jail or prison, or Department of Corrections staff. 7% um, for both coalition staff, or TA provider and reentry specialist. And then 4% researcher or professor. All right, so I'll go ahead and withdraw that question. 
And we would also like to know if you are an OVW grantee. So if you are, please select yes. If not, please select no. And you can do that right on your screen as well. I'll give everybody just a moment to answer that. All right, and I'll close that out now. So it looks like 18% is yes and 55% no. And obviously it doesn't add up. It'll only show us the percentage of the people who answered. <laughs> and if you are an OVW grantee, let me pull this up for you. If you could let us know what type of grant. What is your grant program? Another minute to answer that, or not minute, another five seconds here. All right, and I'll close that out. So it looks like we have 3% RES grantees, 2% LAV grantees, 5% state coalition, 4% SAP, and 1% tribals or SA coalition. All right, thank you all so much. I really appreciate your feedback. And this time I'm going to go ahead and send it over to you, Sue. Thank you, Terry. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sue Ostoff with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women. And I really want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. And, and thank you for joining us for our first webinar and what will be a series of webinars about re-entering survivors. Uh, these webinars, they'll focus on survivors who are re-entering their communities after serving time in jail or prison and we'll send out announcements as they are scheduled, so please watch for those. I want to thank the Office on Violence Against Women and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, SIPSA office, for the support of this reentry work that we've been doing. And I also want to really extend an extra special thanks to Carrie and other colleagues at the Better Women's Justice Project for their amazing help and support with this webinar. So thank you, Carrie. I'm sorry to interrupt, Sue. Is there any way you could speak up a little bit? People are having a hard time hearing you. Okay, is that better? That Today, sounds good to me. Okay. Today's thank webinar you. is titled, A Woman's Journey Home, Challenges for Reentering Women. And I am just so pleased to introduce our very distinguished faculty today, who is Dr. Stephanie Covington, who I suspect many of you have heard speak before, or if you haven't heard her speak, you certainly have heard about her before, for her groundbreaking work in developing gender-responsive, trauma-informed interventions. Dr. Covington is a nationally recognized clinician, author, organizational consultant, and lecturer. And she truly is a pioneer in the field of women's issues, addiction, and recovery. She's developed innovative, gender-responsive, and trauma-informed approaches to the treatment needs of women and girls that result in effective services in a variety of settings, including in jails and prisons. Dr. Covington's work focuses on system change and the development of caring, compassionate, and empowering therapeutic environments. Dr. Covington has published extensively, and many of you may know about her, uh, gender-responsive, trauma-informed treatment curricula, which she's published six. Dr. Covington is based in La Jolla, California, and it's warmer here in Philadelphia today than La Jolla, <laughs> California, and she is the co-director of both the Institute for Relational Development and the Center for Gender and Justice. And, you know, I was thinking about this, and thinking about Dr. Covington, and I can't help wonder if it weren't for her and all her work in the past 25 plus years, I just wonder where would we be now in terms of this increased focus in recent years on interventions that are gender responsive and trauma informed. Without all the work of uh, Dr. Covington's over the many years, I really wonder would so many people, organizations, institutions, and federal agencies focus on gender responsive and trauma informed interventions as they are doing today. I really think it's because of the work of Dr. Covington and many of her colleagues. Um, we have posted a longer biographical sketch about Dr. Covington on our Google Docs and if you don't have the link to that you'll receive it in the follow up email that Carrie was talking about. On that bio and also at the end of Dr. Covington's PowerPoint 
you will see links to her website where you can find a list of her recent articles and descriptions of her seminars uh, for professionals. And Dr. Covington has very generously actually posted many of her articles. You can actually get them from her website. Uh, for those of you who may have just joined us, Carrie Simor, the Better Women's Justice Project in Minneapolis, and I, Sue Ostoff, from the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women in Philadelphia are your hosts today for this webinar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Covington, for all your amazing work and for your willingness to share it with us today. And thank all the participants for joining us for what promises to be a very interesting webinar. And Carrie, before I turn it over to Dr. Covington, is there anything else you'd like to add? Nope, I think we've covered it so far. All right. And so now it is really with great pleasure, and it really truly is an honor that I turn over the little virtual microphone to Dr. Covington. Well, thank you, Sue, for all your generosity, and I'm delighted to be with you today and with the group to talk about an issue that I think is incredibly important, and really women in our criminal justice system, in my mind, are the most invisible women in our communities. And so to have this opportunity to, to spend some time thinking about what some of their struggles and issues are, I think, is important for all of us. Um, the way I've thought about today's webinar, for those of you who are on, is that um, obviously there's a PowerPoint, and I'm going to talk for a while. And there's a way for you to submit questions. And the plan is for me to take the questions at the end of the PowerPoint, unless there's something more critical that has to be addressed during, during the actual presentation. Um, you know, to get going, I, I, to start, I really just want to say a few things, some of the background. You know, we have over a million women in our country today who are under criminal justice supervision, and certainly the majority of those are in community su supervision. And women now represent 17% of all the total offenders in this country. So we're not talking about a small group of women, but a considerable number of women who have come, come into this system. And we also in the United States incarcerate more women per capita than any other country in the world. And so I've just given you here on the slide a few comparisons of places to look at to see that um, we have this um, quote unquote honor of being the country that incarcerates more women than any other. And obviously there's going to have to be some reason behind this because our women do not commit more crime than any other women in other countries. But it really has to do with how we respond to women um, who are breaking uh, some of the rules and, that we have in place. Stephanie, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Sure. Is there any way you could speak a little bit louder, maybe more into the phone? People are having a hard time hearing you. OK, sorry. Is that any better? That sound, I mean, it sounds good to me. So let's see if we can get some feedback in the chat. Okay. Is that a little bit better, folks? Is that you better? Say one more thing? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll do another slide and let's see how, it, how it's going. Um, okay, so there's been this dramatic increase, and I, the slide shows a 23% increase of women in the criminal justice system since the year 2000, um, with over uh, two and a quarter million women arrested uh, in, in 2009. But we really have to go back to around eight, 1986 when we had a change in our drug laws. And with the war on drugs, the idea was that rules, laws were going to be put in place in which um, we'd be picking up all these big drug kingpins. But those laws had a disproportionate impact on women. And it picked up many women uh, who were addicted to, uh, to drugs. And that really is what's underneath this incredible increase of women coming into the system. So when we look at the women, you know, what do, what do we actually know? And uh, Carrie, is the sound better now? Yes, I, it looks like everybody can hear you better now. OK, OK. So <laughs> when we look at women in, in the criminal justice system, what, what do we actually know about them? Um, and these are the characteristics. This would be our national profile of women across the country, that they're disproportionately women of color. They're young women in their early to mid-30s. They're most likely, as I have said, been convicted of a drug or a drug-related offense. So these are drug crimes or property crimes that were often committed in order to um, support a drug habit. There certainly are fragmented family histories with many other family members in the criminal justice system, uh, survivors of physical 
and sexual abuse, significant substance abuse problems with multiple physical and mental health problems. Many of them are unmarried mothers with minor children. Uh, they've had limited vocational training and sporadic work histories and limited education. Now, the other phenomenon that we've seen happening that isn't reflected in this slide are the number of women who are now being arrested on a domestic violence charge. Because again, because of changes in uh, laws that were put in place that again have had a disproportionate impact on women. The issue around the racial disparity, a new study came out saying that while we still have this huge racial disparity, what we're seeing now are more white women coming into the system and there's been a decrease in the number of black women. Um, but you again can see, even with these changing numbers, the racial disparity. And I want to point something out about this. Um, my work allows me to travel a lot. So I'm in various states and I go to different countries. And when I'm in other countries, I ask people, tell me what, what women, women in your community or in your country are the most disadvantaged? And then I ask them, and what women are overly represented in your women's prisons? And those are always the same women. So. Um, women of color in the United States, in Canada, it's the Aboriginal or First Nation women, in New Zealand, it's the Maori women, in Germany, it's women who've immigrated from Turkey. So whatever group of women are most disadvantaged in a country, those are the women who are at greater risk of being in that incarcerated in that country's prison system, which tells you this is a systemic issue. This is not an individual issue. When we look at men and women who are in our criminal justice system, there's certainly a lot of similarities between them, but there are also a considerable number of differences. Um, men who are in the system actually have more employment experience than the women do. They have less substance abuse problems than the women do. There's a difference in criminal involvement. Women. Uh, less than men uh, commit far fewer violent crimes. And when women do commit a violent crime, it's directed towards somebody, it's more, more often directed towards somebody that they know. So for those of us in our communities, we're at less risk of being harmed by a man, by a woman who is a stranger to us than we are by a man who's a stranger to us. So there's a difference in what happens with criminal involvement. Psychological functioning, we see women with more mental health issues. And again, we see higher rates of physical and sexual abuse histories in the women than in the men. And in one study done comparing men and women in uh, one of the state prison systems, they found that the women had three times as much childhood abuse as the men did and eight times as much abuse in their adult lives. So the differences are quite significant. And again, so we have these differences between men and women, but we have a system of service. The criminal justice system itself has been designed for men. And then the expectation is women come into this system, and often, of course, they don't get their needs met at all. Another thing that's really shared by the women are children. Um, while the men in prison also are fathers, Far fewer of them are the uh, custodial parent, particularly at time of arrest. So we see that women in our state prison, 65% of minor children, women in our federal system. Here in California, 80% of the women in our California prisons are mothers. And there was a study done looking at the mothers and their children, and 250 women in one particular um, uh, prison unit Represented, 900, represented 920 uh, children. So we can see that there's the impact on the woman's life, but then there's also the impact on her family. Okay, was someone saying something to me in just a moment ago? No? Okay. When people begin to talk about women in prison, the question always comes up, well, well why? You know, why, how do women get into prison? Why do they get into prison? And there are various theories about what creates a criminal. And, you know, someone, some people talk about there is a genetic component, and other people say, no, it's the environment. 
Well, one of the things for sure that we know is the laws we put in place create criminals. So if there was a law that was passed while we're on this webinar that says you can't have more than 200 people on a webinar, we then by definition are now criminals. And essentially that's what happened with these changing drug laws. And the pathways perspective is one of the theories used to look at uh, women's pathways into the criminal justice system. And we believe that women's crimes are embedded in the conditions of their life and that they're specific life course events that put women at risk. And so my colleague Barbara Bloom, Dr. Bloom, has talked about triple jeopardy, the impact of race, class, and gender. And when those three things come together, that increases risk. Uh, my colleague Barbara Owen, Dr. Owen, talks about multiple marginality and how women in the criminal justice system are on the margins of our society. They're often on the margins of their families, at school, at work, and in their communities. And trauma and addiction are the two areas I've looked at in terms of life course events that put women at risk to come into the system. The other difference we see between the men and women is women's experience in the system and how they do their time. Um, doing time is one of the terms used about how women uh, describe what it's like to be in a uh, custodial setting, to be incarcerated in a jail or a prison. And so I'm going to go through each of these and just give you a kind of a flavor of, of how to think about this. Um, first, we'll look at bail. Now, we would say, oh, you know, the judge sets bail for $5,000 for a man and $5,000 for a woman, and we would say, well, that's fair, that's equal. But what you have to look at, you have to look underneath the numbers of what actually happens. Um, if bail is set for a man, how he makes bail generally is the females in his life, mothers, girlfriends, wives, run around and help gather the money for his bail. When bail is set for a woman, very often the men in her life do not run around and help her make bail. The other thing that's different is when we look at the economic differences between men and women, that since women uh, make about 76 cents for every dollar a man makes, the $5,000 bail for a woman is actually more money than the $5,000 bail for the man. So bail, there's a difference there. Sentencing policies. As I said, this whole issue of what happened with the uh, war on drugs and the mandatory sentencing so that judges cannot discern or um, make recommendations, but in some places have to give certain sentences uh, for certain drug crimes, has had this, uh, as I said, disproportionate impact on women. The classification systems that are used in our prisons were designed, they were designed for men. And a few states now are beginning to look at how to modify those because in most cases, women are overly classified, which means when you have a classification as to the level of inmates you are, that determines your housing, it determines your privileges, it determines your programming. And if you have a higher classification than what you really are in terms of risk, um, it limits and defines what your experience is going to be like in prison. Programming. Men's prisons have more programming than women's prisons. And even women's programs uh, that we see in some of the women's facilities are the programs that were designed for men. And there are ways that this is also very discriminatory. I'll, I'll give you an example of one state that had a program for mothers where the mothers could read a story to their children and it would be put on an audio tape and then that audio tape would be sent to the child. When they decided to have a fathering program in the men's prisons, they got video cameras, videotapes, um, very sophisticated system, so the dads could send a read a story to their children. It would be videotaped and sent home to the kids. The state had 27 men's prisons, and they all had the capacity to do video. 
the state had two women's programs, and both of those programs were always scrounging around trying to get enough audio tapes. And this is not uncommon in the differential in programming. Mother-child contact. Um, as I said, many women uh, have children. They were the custodial parent. Um, now their families are very often taking care of the children while the mother is incarcerated. Well, what happens with visitation? Prison visiting rooms are not conducive to good contact with your child. And I've also had women say to me, I cannot go through the experience of having a cavity search when I leave the visiting room and go back into the general population, and so I'd rather not see my child. And so there are many things that stand in the way of good mother-child contact. And the management strategies used in correctional facilities, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but they often re-traumatize the women. And then we come to this bottom piece, which is the transition into the community, which is really the focus of today, is what are the differences? And we'll be talking about that, but one of the primary differences in the transition to the community, part, part of it has to do with the response of family. That very often when a woman is going back into the community, um, she has multiple uh, different agencies she has to deal with with conflicting demands. A man goes back into the community, and often his family says, well, you could just sleep on my sofa till you get a job. Many women have abusive boyfriends. Uh, families do not want them around. If they have children, as I said, they have multiple agencies. And so the actual transition back into the community is a very different experience for a woman than it is for a man. And because of all these differences, the National Institute of Corrections a few years ago, um, we offered a, a research project. And um, we were awarded this uh, uh, agreement uh, to do research for the National Institute of Corrections and develop guiding principles for working with female offenders. And these were our six guiding principles. And what we were trying to do was to bring knowledge that we have learned over the years about women's lives in places outside of the criminal justice system and bring that information into the criminal justice system since, as I said, it was a system designed for men and women were not even um, really considered at all. So that first guiding principle you'll see is gender. You have to acknowledge that gender makes a difference. And for all of you that, that work in agencies in various environments, you know that if you're in a place that says gender doesn't matter, the chances of women and girls getting good services in an agency that says gender doesn't matter, not very good. And so this very fundamental issue. And just kind of a reminder, you know, sex differences are the biological differences, the physiological difference between men and women men and women. But the gender differences are the difference in the experience of growing up male or female. It's the difference in the messages you get growing up. Um, you know, and I'm talking here about gender, male or female, but we certainly also know that there is a transgendered population. And if we really want to understand gender differences, if you have a conversation with someone who, let's say, was born uh, with a male body and spent part of their life as a male and then made the transition to female, they can tell you very much about the differences of being male or being female in the world in which we live. So gender matters. The next principle has to do with environment, safety, respect, and dignity. And think about the challenges of having and developing that kind of an environment in a criminal justice setting that was clearly developed historically as being a place of punishment. And so this becomes very challenging. Relationships, policies, practices, and programs that are relational and help women feel connected to their families, their significant others, and their children. So the relational piece is incredibly important. Many of the women commit their crimes in the context of relationship. Many women are drew, introduced to alcohol and other drugs in the context of relationship. And many women experience abuse in the context of relationship. So the relational piece is, is incredibly important. 
And we want our services to be integrated and culturally relevant. And think how complicated this is even in our communities to think about having substance abuse, trauma, and mental health into some kind of integrated comprehensive service. Even more complicated when, we, when we're talking about the criminal justice system. And here's this one socioeconomic status, sort of back to the issue we were talking about with bail. You know, we have to provide women with opportunities to improve their socioeconomic conditions. There are many women who commit their crimes not only to support a drug habit, but some of their crimes are economically driven in order to support themselves or their families. There's some women in the criminal justice system that have never really earned money in what we would consider a, a legal way. This be, a study just came out a few weeks ago that was fascinating to me. It said in the year 2012, if a woman and man were working in the same job category, a woman would have to work 93 extra days that year to have the same income as the man, 93 extra days. So we, we've been talking about this for over 30 years, I think, and hasn't improved much at all. And then in our communities, we need comprehensive and collaborative community services, and we're going to spend more time on that at, at, at the end of this presentation. So because of all these differences, we've developed some language. You know, We used to talk about being gender specific, which meant essentially services for women, but then began to realize that people said they were gender specific, but that might mean that uh, the women were in an all-women's group, but they got the same material the men got. Um, it really didn't incorporate what we were hoping women would get. And so a colleague, Barbara Bloom, and I developed this definition to try to help people begin to think about what's really needed in terms of being uh, gender responsive. And there are two pieces to the definition you'll notice. One has to do with the environment of the program, and the other is the content of the program. And they're both very important. And in the environment, you have to think about where the program actually exists. So if it's in a correctional setting, you know it's got some particular challenges. Um, who's going to work there? How you're going to develop the program? And I think the key question here is you think about what do we want the women to leave with? And then you have to back map into thinking about what you need to provide. And then the content and material that you actually provide the women, does it reflect, can the women find themselves? Can they see themselves? And all this needs to reflect an understanding of the realities of the women's lives. And it has to deal with their strengths and their challenges. So again, that whole concept of being strength-based. So it isn't just about picking up a curriculum and running a group. That's a good beginning, but that in and of itself is just one step in the process of being gender responsive. So being gender responsive really means using this lens of women's lives, and you look through that lens and you see what's reflected back to you. And if we went back to that earlier slide that's our national profile, it basically tells us the multiple issues that women are challenged with. And one of the things that comes up over and over again is the issue of trauma. Women in the criminal justice system have much higher rates of childhood and adult trauma than women in the general population. This is the group of women in our society that have the highest rates of physical and sexual abuse in their lives. And our research tells us that trauma history is associated with uh, substance abuse, high-risk behaviors, being a sex worker, having mental health problems, having physical health problems. So again, this tells us where we need to be directing our attention and what kinds of services need to be provided. And then we have this other experience of trauma also being a re-traumatize, I mean, prison being a re-traumatizing experience. So you have women coming into a system where the standard operating practices of the system often re-traumatize the women. So think about a woman who's been raped and was restricted during that. So what happens when she's handcuffed or shackled, put in restraints? What happens with uh, pat searches and cavity searches? Just, just to give you an example, in California, 
Up until two years ago, pap searches could be conducted on women by either male or female correctional officers. And for some women, that is an incredible trigger. Internationally, there has been an international ruling um, and guidelines uh, since the 60s saying that women in correctional settings around the world should not be pat searched by men. But the United States never signed that international agreement. So we have many things we've done. The shackling, we have women who are shackled during labor. Oh. And I mean, and when I've asked correctional officers about this or places where this is their policy, they tell me it's a safety issue. And my response is, if you've ever been in labor, you know that running is not an issue. So no woman is a safety issue during labor. She is not running away. So these, these are things that are still happening in, in correctional settings to women. So we can see the whole issue of of triggers and re-traumatization. We also have differences again between men and women when we look at trauma. And we see these differences when we look over the lifespan. Um, in childhood, both males and females, boys and girls, are at risk for physical and sexual abuse. But when you look over the course of life, so you begin to see the differences. So in adolescence, for a boy who's a teenager, his risk of being harmed uh, goes up. He's at greater risk if he's a gay young man or a young man of color. And his risk comes from people who dislike him, like the police and like some of his peers. If he's a gang member, again, his risk comes from the oppositional gang. But See, his risk comes from people who dislike him, but in her teenage years for the girl, her risk for abuse comes from her relationships, from the people to whom she's saying, I love you. We move into adult life. For a man serving in the military, his greatest risk for abuse comes from the enemy. If he's living in our communities as a man, his greatest risk for harm comes from being a victim of crime committed by a stranger. For a woman in her adult life, if she's serving in the military, her greatest risk comes from the men she's serving with. And if she's living in our communities, her greatest risk for harm comes from her relationships, again, from the person to whom she's saying, I love you. So when we work with men, whether they're in our communities or in our criminal justice system, you very seldom work with a man who was harmed in his childhood by someone he was in a relationship with, was harmed in his adolescence by someone he was in a primary relationship with, and then in his adult life was harmed by someone he was in a relationship with. But that scenario is fairly common in the lives of women, and particularly the women in the criminal justice system. And it's also why we think clinically women have more mental health disorders connected to their trauma histories than men do. And so we begin to see the sort of the centrality of violence and trauma when we look at a lot of our social issues, that violence and trauma increase incarceration, and incarceration increases violence and trauma. It increases substance abuse, and substance abuse increases it, increases mental health problems. So we see all of these things very interconnected. You know, they're not isolated. Now, when we go to provide services, they all get fragmented and separated, but in people's lives, they're all interconnected, and in our society, they're all interconnected. And we see now that people are beginning to talk about this new sort of concept or language, trauma-informed services, and I'm sure most of you have heard this, you know, trauma-informed. So what does that mean? And often there's confusion about this um, because there are trauma-informed services and there are trauma-specific services. Trauma-specific services are the trauma interventions that we use when we're um, providing services to people. But trauma-informed means we think about trauma and we think about what uh, are the things that trigger reactions in people and we adjust the organization so that trauma survivors can 
access and benefit from whatever service we're trying to provide. And the example I often use is my dentist is trauma-informed. So here's a woman who does her dental practice through the lens of trauma in terms of how she tells people they can get up and walk around so they don't have to stay seated if they don't want to. She does breathing exercises before the heavy plate for an x-ray is put on the chest. You can watch TV with headphones or listen to music. There are many things that she does because she realized that the dental office is filled with triggers. So that's being trauma-informed. She does not provide trauma treatment. And there's some core principles involved. And when you look at the list, it looks simple. But let me tell you, for most agencies, these are very complicated. Providing physical and emotional safety. Do we do that? Trustworthiness. Some places providing services can't start a group on time. Choice and collaboration. How much choice do we actually give people? I was on a phone consultation last night and with uh, some people that were doing site visits to some agencies that I'm working with to help them become gender responsive and trauma informed. And so we have people go out and actually call and make appointments and go through the intake process and then give agencies feedback about what they experienced. One of the things that happened is the financial office came out into the waiting room and had a conversation in front of everybody in the waiting room about how this person was going to pay and what their financial condition was. Uh, that doesn't feel safe. That's not about trustworthiness. So these are some of the fundamental things that need to be in place if, in fact, an agency or someone providing service is going to provide in that environment. And we want these core principles to be there both for the women as well as for the staff. So what actually happens when, when there's trauma? So this chart can kind of help us see how things are interconnected. So you have a traumatic event. Um, it overwhelms someone both physically and psychologically. And I think that's important to understand because sometimes we get focused on the psychological only. And for adults, the response is intense fear, helplessness, or horror. Now, for children, the more typical response is disorganized or agitated behavior. And then we have these other responses to the trauma, and you end up with a person with a sensitized nervous system and changes in the brain. So how the brain functions and the brain chemistry changes. And then there's a current stressor. This could be the experience of being arrested, this could be the experience of living the drug life on the streets. Um, stressors can come from anywhere. And the person's in a painful emotional state. And we see three categories of responses. The retreat responses that are more like our mental health responses, the isolation, the dissociation, which is a mind-body split, the depression, and the anxiety. We have the harm to self. And here we see the substance abuse, the eating disorders, the deliberate self-harm, the cutting and burning that people do, and the suicidal uh, actions, the suicide attempts. And the harm to others would be the aggression, the violence, and rages. Now, we also see a difference between men and women here. Women are more apt to do the left-hand box and the middle box, and men are more likely to do the right-hand box and the middle box. I'm not saying that men don't ever have any mental health, disorders connected to trauma, nor am I saying women are never violent and aggressive. But as a generalization, uh, we do see a difference in, in responses. Now, I want to spend a couple minutes on this, and I'm going to ask all of you if you would make a list from 1 to 10. So if you have pencil and paper, if you'd make two lists and number them 1 to 10, I'm going to give you some questions and I'm going to ask you to answer these twice uh, by saying yes or no. And this is the ACE study, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And it can help us understand the interconnections between uh, trauma and what happens to people later in life. And all these questions have to do before age 18. So again, it's going to be yes or no. And I'm going to have you think about a typical woman you work with. That's going to be one list of responses you're going to make yes or no to the questions. And the other list is going to be thinking about yourself and your own life experience. 
So the first question is, before age 18, did you experience recurrent and severe emotional abuse? So answer yes or no for yourself, and then answer yes or no for a typical woman that you work with. And the second question is recurrent and severe physical abuse. Again, answering yes or no for yourself and your personal experience, and then yes or no for the typical woman that you've picked. Third question is contact sexual abuse. Fourth question is physical neglect. Fifth question is emotional neglect. Again, answering twice. And then again, thinking about before age 18, did you grow up in a household with an alcoholic or drug-using uh, person in the household? Not you, but another person. So you answer for yourself, yes or no, and then you answer for the typical woman. Did you have a family member who was imprisoned? Question eight is, was there a mentally ill, chronically depressed, or institutionalized family member? Again, answering twice, yes or no for yourself, and then for a typical woman you selected. Question nine, was your mother being treated violently? And then question 10, were both biological parents not physically present, such as there was a separation, a divorce, an out-of-home placement? And then I'm going to have you score this. And the scoring is you count one point for each yes answer. So you're going to have a score from 0 to 10 for yourself. And then you're going to have a score from 0 to 10 for the typical woman that you've selected. And then there's a way for you to raise your hand and answer this question. Okay. Can you let me know how many of you work with a woman who has a score of over four? So if you'll raise your hand. It looks like most of you already figured that out, but if you do want to raise your hand, just select that big hand icon to the top right of Stephanie's photo. Okay, and so we're still getting numbers here. So these are, if you're working with someone who has a score, we're still calculating. The computer's doing its calculations here. Well, it's clearly um, the far majority have a score of over four. And four was the major cutoff point. So far we have, uh, what, 121, 120 people working with a woman with a score of four or more. And as I said, well, now 121. So okay, let me show you what the reason, 122. Here's more. Well, some of you are still doing this. So the scores are still coming in um, where we're finding that the women have very high scores on this. And I would also venture that many of you have a high score. And that's why it's really important um, to listen to what we've learned from the study, OK? What they first did with the study is they looked at smoking, alcoholism, injection of illegal drugs, and obesity. And what they found were that the people, and 17,000 people participated in this initial uh, study. Subsequently, another 26,000 people participated. But they found that many years later, many years later, 30, 40, 50 years later, the people who were struggling, struggling with smoking, alcoholism, they were injecting illegal drugs and or obesity were people who had a score of four or more on this 10-point um, scale. Then they went back and they looked at chronic health problems. They looked at lung cancer. They looked at pulmonary disease. They looked at diabetes. They looked at um, a whole long list of chronic health problems. And this is where we began to understand that these adverse childhood experiences, traumatic things that happen in childhood, can have a huge impact not just on mental health but also on physical health. Now, this same study was taken into a prison system. And what they found was that, yes, the women who had the most physical health problems were the women who had higher scores 
on that 10 question survey, they found the largest effect was on mental health. These were the women who had had more mental health treatment, more attempted suicide, were on more psychotropic medication. And then look at this. There was a 980% increase in her risk of having a mental health problem if she had a score of seven or more. And so we begin to see some of these connections I was talking about earlier between having the experience of violence and trauma in one's life in this particular study in childhood, but then the implications later in life. And the reason I had you do your score is because we know that people who are often in the helping professions are not the best at self-care. And so I wanted you to take the study so you'd look at your number and realize if you've had some of these things in your past history, it's really important to think about how you take care of yourself because of your own vulnerability. And when people say to me, well, what, what do you mean by self-care? Well, I mean eating nutritious food, getting enough sleep, um, going to a funny movie, a whole variety of things, okay, because the work you do is stressful. So this probably looks a lot like your clients, right? They're just multiple issues all intersecting together. And a good friend and colleague of mine a number of years ago developed this concept for assessment. She calls it the level of burden. And instead of doing fancy assessments with her clients, she decided that the women would get a score for the level of burden that they carried. And she found that as she started to use this in her large agency, staff began to think about the women differently. The women began to think about themselves differently. And what we're talking about really for the women who are in the criminal justice system and the women who are trying to get home and get integrated into our communities, they usually have a very high level of burden. Now, the work that I've done that Sue mentioned and things I've developed is, I call it the Women's Integrated Treatment Model. The acronym is WIT which really is there on purpose because I think we need to keep our sense of humor and sometimes doing work that is so serious it's hard um, it's hard to be able to have a sense of balance and hold on to one's sense of humor but this model is sort of holistic and it's based on the definition and guiding principles I gave you there's theory that undergrounds all of it and I believe our interventions with women need to be multi-dimensional we need to be doing cognitive behavioral techniques, but we also need to be doing uh, mindfulness. We need to be doing um, art. We need to be doing movement. We be, need to be doing a whole variety of different kinds of uh, techniques when working with them. The theories that I use, I use pathways that we talked about earlier. And I also use a relational theory that talks about how about women's psychological development. And this comes from the Stone Center at Wellesley. And I think it basically grounds all my work. And I think relationships are so important in women's lives. They also can be difficult in women's lives. So it's important for us to have an understanding of this. And then trauma theory and addiction theory. So these are the theories I weave together to create a foundation for the work. And as I said before, this relational piece is, is particularly important because often the reasons why women have committed crime have a relational basis to them. It uh, often impacts their behavior while they're under criminal justice supervision. It often is their motivation for change. Many women are motivated for change because of their relationship with their children. And it impacts their reintegration into the community and where things uh, work well or don't work well is often because of what's happening in their relationships. This is just a laundry list of some of the things that I've written. Um, there are programs for substance abuse. There's program materials for trauma. Uh, there's something for women with 12 steps. The Voices is a girls program. I also have a training curriculum for correctional professionals to understand trauma, particularly in correctional settings. The new work I've been working on is um, material for women who commit violent, aggressive crimes. And there will be a program for women who are criminal justice involved, and there will also be a program for women who are in our communities. And this work has been very um, 
what shall I say? This work has been very much influenced by the hours I spent with women who have committed, who've used force in their lives and therefore been arrested for violent crimes. And they've gone through the exercises, given me feedback, and we're very involved in the development of this material. There's also some self-help books on relationships, sexuality, and again, the 12 steps. And people always, is it evidence-based? Yes. But here comes sort of the crux of the matter. Everyone says use evidence-based material, right? And everyone wants to know what works. But I'd like us to step back and ask this question first. What is the work? What is the work? And I believe when we're working with women in the criminal justice system, there are four main parts to the work. One is prevention. How do we prevent the women from coming into this system? What are the things we have to be in, have in place for both women and girls involved in our justice system? The women who do come into the system do no harm. What are the changes that have to be made so at least we're doing no harm? The services need to be gender responsive. They need to be developed through the lens of looking at women's lives. And everything needs to be focused on reentry to the community. Um, most, you know, there's a certain percentage of women who will be in our prisons either for a very long time, if not for life. But the majority of them leave, and we want them to leave in better shape than they came in, not in worse. When we were doing the project for the National Institute of Corrections that I mentioned earlier, we worked, we did lots of focus groups as well as reading lots of literature and research. And we also did focus groups not just with professionals in the field, but also women who were incarcerated. And one of the focus questions was, what did you need in your community that, if it had been there, might have prevented you from being in here in this prison? And the women talked about they needed substance abuse treatment, they needed job skills, they needed child care, they needed DV services, mental health, physical health care, housing. They, there were many things that they needed in their communities that they felt would have helped them and prevented them from coming into the criminal justice system. And ironically, this list of needs that the women gave us are exactly the same things people are now talking about providing for reentry which I look at and I think, but why wouldn't we provide these things up front as prevention? But we don't do that in our country. So unfortunately, we're now discussing it after the women have already been incarcerated, which is very unfortunate. The other thing is we have to make community invent investment. What would it be like if we funded our community like we fund prisons? Um, our prisons are our biggest growth industry in this country. What if we use that money and funded programs in our communities? When we talk about women moving and transitioning out of a prison back into community, really the plan has to start from the beginning. Prisons that seem to do this best are prisons that let community agencies reach into the prison, come into the prison, so the women are meeting people who are providing services in the community, so they have a face to go with the phone number or with the agency name. And we need wraparound services, services that literally wrap around the woman that are comprehensive so that she isn't in a situation where she has all these conflicting requirements from a variety of different agencies that are impossible for her to meet. And of course, the services need to be women-centered. The first thing she needs when she leaves prison are some just some basic needs. She needs a place to live, she needs food, she needs clothing, and she needs money. And we cannot assume she has that. Women are often released with no place to go. Sometimes they're released with $100. Some places they're released with the clothing they came into the jail or prison with. So um, a couple of years ago in Chicago, which is notorious for cold winters, a woman was being released from the Cook County Jail. The woman who ran one of the programs there saw this woman coming out, and she was in pantyhose and a sweater in the winter, and said, what? The woman said, I've just been released. She walked the woman back in and said, where are the woman's clothes? And they said, well, that's what she was wearing when she was arrested. So ridiculous things happen. Wow. And the goal for women in the community, 
They're expected to stay sober, abide by the law, take care of herself, take care of her children or family, and comply with the conditions of her release or her pro- probation. And often these conditions are really difficult. The majority of women who are rearrested are not arrested on a new crime. They're rearrested on a violation of their parole. So let's say that she had a substance abuse problem. She was in the treatment program in the prison if she was lucky to get a slot. She came out and she used and she was arrested. She will go back to prison. Not because she had a slip or a relapse because she's an addict, but she broke the the condition of her parole. So she will be back in prison. Then there are a whole slew of other pressures, the expectations of family members. Family members have a very different feeling about women who are in the criminal justice system than men in the system. It's considered more shameful. It's more of a stigma. There's the issue of the previous family violence and often not having any DV services. There's the untreated trauma, depression, and mental illness. How was she going? How did she learn to parent? Um, she doesn't have an education, getting a job. It's very difficult for women who've been in the criminal justice system to get any kind of a job. There's a huge prejudice. Often are issues around immigration, unable to vote. So there are many things, many pressures that she's trying to meet. And then we have legal barriers. These other laws we've put in place that prohibit her from moving forward. It used to be that very often women in prison could also take college level courses or they can, in most prisons you can get a GED. But beyond that, it's very difficult to increase your education. And what happened in 98 is many of those grants were, uh, if you were in a prison, you are now ineligible for those educational grants. Section 8 housing. If I'm a woman and I have a drug offense, I cannot live in public housing. But if I have a manslaughter charge, I can. So being a drug, having a drug offense limits your ability to get public housing. The Adoption and Safe Families Act was put in place and said that women didn't have contact with her children for, I think it's 15 out of uh, 22 months. Then she can lose parental rights. Well, think about the complication of being in a woman's prison far from your family. Your family doesn't have the resources to bring the children to visit. The phones that are in prisons uh, have to be pay phones, and they have an add-on charge to them, so the call is about five times more expensive than you and I, well, if we could find a pay phone, made a telephone call. Um, there are just, again, many barriers that are legal barriers also to women moving ahead in the community. So here are my recommendations if we really want to improve reentry services for women. Number one, an alternative to incarceration should be the first sanction, should be our first choice. Keep her out of prison. Try to provide something. I also, one of the questions I always ask wardens, and this is again across this country and other countries, I say, of all the women that are incarcerated here in this prison that you supervise, what percentage of them do you think could be supervised in the community? And the number I am given is usually 75%. Wardens believe that 75% of the women in their prison could be in the community. So that tells us something, right? Um, the planning for her reentry needs to start when she comes in. Very often, the planning starts in the last 30 to 60 days, and there's not enough time. They need tools and support. Um, our communities need resources, and we have to look at those public policies and those laws that we, I talked about before. We have some models for reentry. Um, so I'm going to share three things with you, really. The first one is Catholic Charities. Now, Catholic Charities provide services to people leaving prison, but they're almost 100%, probably 95% utilized by men. For some reason, women do not realize that Catholic Charities provide services, but it's the model I really want to discuss. Catholic Charities has a model that they use with refugees. If you are fleeing a country and you come to this country and you have nothing, 
Catholic Charities will help you to find housing, to find work. They'll help you set up an apartment. They'll help you get clothing. They have a whole model they work with with refugees who come to this country with nothing. It is that refugee model that I think we have to think about with women. Very often when women leave prison, they leave with nothing and they need everything. So we need to think of them as coming to a new place, particularly for women who've had long-term incarceration. Can you imagine? Think about your life 20 years ago and think about how much has changed in terms of computers, cell phones, public transportation that uses tokens you don't put money in. I mean, there are just so many things about how we live in our environment that for someone who's been incarcerated for 20 years, they've had no experience with. They have to learn it all new. The other place that does, I think, great reentry for women is um, uh, Our Place DC. And Our Place DC is a recovery program that was started actually by a colleague of mine who stepped back and said, the women who were in Washington, D.C. were incarcerated in prisons surrounding D.C. because the jail that had been, or prison that had been for D.C. women had been closed because of a, a lawsuit against them because they were so horrible. So that place was closed, but that sent women further away from home. So what she did is she got a list of all the women who were residents of D.C. and located them in all the various prisons where they were, and she and her staff would visit each woman they would give her a number that she could call toll free, told them if she needed something to call them, if she needed someone to pick them, if she needed someone to pick her up when she was released, because some women were being released at five minutes after midnight with a bus pass where she had to walk two blocks to the bus in the dark to get on a bus to be taken somewhere in the middle of the night. Um, they said they will come pick her up. And they started by providing what the women asked for and said they needed. And then that expanded into having a place with clothing, with food, with legal services, with medical help, programming for children. The program just expanded and expanded, all by what the women talked about, what they needed. So I think Our Place DC is, is a model for women's reentry services. And the other place I want to share with you, the other model comes from the United Kingdom in England. And what they've been doing the last few years for their women in prison is across England, there are women's community centers. These are not connected to the criminal justice system. They are community centers that provide services for women. They provide drug counseling. They provide DV services. They have child care facilities. They'll help you find a lawyer. They'll help you find all kinds of things. So what they have done is they are now connecting the women coming out of prison with the women's community centers. And the women, their support groups, and the women now get connected to the community center, and she doesn't have to say whether she's come out of a prison or not. So the women are not in a special agency for women coming out of prison. They're in a women's agency. And that model has worked incredibly well in England. So I'm going to share with you as we begin to close the presentation what women really tell us. I mean, if we really want to talk about experts, the experts are the women themselves. And this was a project done with women who were formerly incarcerated women who were now living uh, successfully in the community. It doesn't mean their life didn't have challenge, but, but living successfully. And here's some of the things that they told us. Uh, first, they talked about their children, and they they realized their children had been deeply affected by having a mother who was in the prison system. And there was a lot of shame and guilt around that. Um, and they felt as though society had labeled them a bad mother. They often felt bad themselves. And that there were very few resources to help them. Um, we know that women who commit any kind of child-related crimes are especially stigmatized. Um, while I was doing the research and working a lot with women who are incarcerated for violent offenses, I also uh, began to do some work and research on women who had committed sex offenses. And these women are not only stigmatized in the community, they're stigmatized within the prison system. 
uh, themselves. Um, re being re reunited with children is a goal for most women, but not all women. And I think we have to uh, be accepting of that. People often think that when women are incarcerated, their children must be in foster care, but the majority of them are being taken care of uh, by, by their mothers or their families. Now, this could be good or bad news because if the woman grew up in a family where there was physical and sexual abuse and that ex her experience during her childhood, now her children are in that same environment. And um, just to reiterate that women certainly need resources and support for reunification. Women also talked about what hurt the most, what didn't work. And it was the dehumanizing and harmful medical and psychiatric interventions, things that were said and done that were actually harmful. There's a lot of harassment and um, name calling in the prison. I mean, because I visit prisons a lot, and you'd think when a visitor comes, everyone would be on their best behavior, but not necessarily so. There's often things that you see and hear and happens and people uh, seem to think that that's okay. The disruption of important medications. This is a huge issue for reentry. Some prisons actually do a fairly decent job in terms of assessment and diagnosis and then appropriate medication for women, but then they leave and go back into their communities and often there's no medication. Sometimes they might be given 30 days of medication, but sometimes they're given nothing. And then they've got to somehow get into the community and figure out when you have no resources, how do you get the medication that you need? Um, using force, the restraint, the isolation, the things we talked about earlier, that's also a painful experience. Um, the living conditions, the processing, you know, one young woman said to me the most horrible thing, she was 26, um, she had been on a blind date and the two boys in the car stopped at a 7-Eleven, went in to rob it, had a gun, there was a murder. So she had a life without parole charge, 26. And when she came into the prison, the person that was processing her said, what do you want us to do with the body? She said, what? She thought she was going to be die in prison, be killed. The question was, who do we call in case of emergency? That's the dehumanizing processing. Um, there's abuse that can happen in correctional settings, including sexual abuse for people who are non-English speaking, that's very challenging. Um, the stigma, have been in, having been in the system, and just the lack of support for, for moving and transitioning out of the system. And the women also talked about what helped. The relationships with people who cared, listened, and could be trusted. Um, having other women in particular, they said that that was having well-trained staff, particularly female staff, having women who are role models, getting the right assessment and classification, getting the right medication, and having programs, not just incarceration, but the job training, mental health. You know, when we go back to that national profile of who the women are, it tells us exactly what they need. We need, we need programs that deal with the realities of their lives. Inmate-centered programs. There's some prisons that actually have inmates talk about what programming they need and they help to develop it. That happens in Bedford Hills in uh, New York State. Trying to reduce the trauma. Having some financial resources. There's a great reentry program in Hawaii for women coming out of the prison there. And the director of that program helps the women to start saving money to get jobs so that when they move out of that reentry program, they generally have from two to five thousand dollars that they've saved of the money they've earned. For many of them, they have never had that kind had their own money, and of course, a safe environment. So, what makes a difference in all of this? I think three primary things. One is the safe environment. Wherever she is, she has to feel safe. She has to feel like she's in a place that's like a shelter. Um, listening to her story when she's ready to tell it, um, not when we, when we feel it needs to be told. And the story is an important piece. We know that's part of the healing process for, for anyone. And then empathy. And empathy, you know, all this business about evidence-based practice, there are over a thousand studies that say the most important thing is the therapeutic alliance. It's the connection between the person seeking help and the per person providing a service. And the most important part of that 
that therapeutic alliance is the empathic moment. And we, we all know this from our own lives, really. That's when you're sharing something important to you with another person, and they respond to you in a way that you know you've been seen and heard. And that's the true moment of connection, and that's the empathic connection, and that's what women need to experience. So in closing, and before we take the questions, um, what I'd like you to think about, when I think about women in prison, I believe that women who are in prison, that their lives represent the issues that, in, that are in all of our lives as women, except we see all these issues magnified, and so their challenges are um, often often much more than most of us think that we could ever manage. And so the pictures I have up here on screen are formerly incarcerated women who are now living and doing well in our communities. So um, I think, Carrie, are you going to help me with the questions? Um, yes, I believe Sue was We both can. Okay, great. Stephanie, thank you for that really excellent presentation. Oh, you're welcome. It's incredibly helpful, and we've gotten a lot of feedback throughout the webinar, people about wanting to make sure they're going to get the PowerPoint. And uh, Carrie, do you want to weigh in on that right now? Yes, I just wanted to, um, as I stated in the chat, to let everybody know that the PowerPoint is available on the Google Docs, um, and that link was included in the confirmation slash invitation email that you all received. And you'll also receive it again with the confirmation of your attendance email that you'll all receive shortly after the webinar takes place today. Uh, and Stephanie, since you were not probably, hopefully, paying attention to all the chat, the other thing that No, I didn't do any of okay. that. Um, the other thing that was just really clear is the desire of people to connect with one another and exchange information and resources. That would be great for people. Um, so, it, so just you know, a heads up, we're going to sponsor a number of, ser uh, of webinars about women's reentry issues, and so please stay tuned because um, the more exchanges that we can have, it's obviously uh, the better, and it's clear that that's something that people want. So good. Uh, one, the other thing is, I think Stephanie, everybody wants to go to your dentist now. <laughs> Well, I'll, I think it's a great example because we can all relate to it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and here's someone really who's excellent. not providing trauma treatment, really but excellent. she is trauma informed. She right. got it. Um, so we have time for just a couple questions here. Uh, so I apologize if we're not able to get to your question, uh, participants. We'll try to do what we can to um, get to the ones that as many as we can. Um, one of them came up very early on in when you were talking about the difficulty women were having in getting bail. Yes. Uh, and the question was whether or not you know of any data on why female relatives or friends don't help females with bail. I think it has to do with shame and stigma. Uh huh. And often the females in her life, let's say her mother, is now taking care of her, is going to have to take care of her child. She's angry. <laughs> really angry. Plus there's a bigger social issue, which is women are supposed to be good. You know, we're not supposed to commit crimes. We're not supposed to do bad things. So there's just a different different kind of response to it. Have you seen any studies that actually look at that? I, I haven't. I haven't, no. Okay. Uh, another question that came in to us was, when talking about women being harmed more often in the context of relationships, does this include witnessing violence? And if so, are there gender, gender differences in witnessing? You know, no, I'm talking about actual experience as in being the victim. I don't think that that's true. I think there's a lot of violence in men's lives, both the violence that they get involved in and perpetrating, but in the male community of, of witnessing. So, but you know, a lot of what we know it's very interesting. A lot of studies have never teased out male-female differences. So they'll talk about the number of children that have witnessed violence, but they won't say boy or girl children. They don't differentiate. So I can't I can't answer that question, but I don't I don't think that necessarily women have witnessed more violence than men have. Uh, and the studies that I you know that I did talk about in terms of the criminal justice population. They were one of those that, that looked at, and you know, I can get you that reference for the study of um, 
when they looked at the men and women in prison and the difference between their childhood and adult. But that was about being victims, not about witnessing. And Stephanie, could you also just flip to the next slide where I believe you do have your website listed? Oh, sure. The last one, just so people can have that. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, another question was, what was the study in which it was found that women experienced three times the amount of childhood abuse and eight times adult abuse? Yes, more that's than men? the study that was done at UCLA, and I'm just looking to see who the primary. Um, it's a Nina Messina, William Burden, and Michael Prendergast. I'm not sure all the participants wrote that down. Yeah, I'm sure they did. And actually, let me suggest that if people go to one of the websites, either the Stephanie Covington or the Center for Gender and Justice website, and you go to where it says articles online or publications online, there is a paper called A Woman's Journey Home and Challenges for Female Offenders. And I've, I have... Um, it's all about women's reentry, but it also quotes that particular study. Okay, and so I'm looking quickly through here to see if I can find the um, the reference better. If not, you could email me, and we'll give you the 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 reference for that paper. Or Carrie, we can post that on Google Docs. Correct? Yes, we can do that. Okay. Do you want to post the whole paper? Do you want us to send you the whole paper, or just the reference? Uh, Whichever you would like. Whatever's easier for you. And there was also a question about the full site for the Messina and Grella article. And I will send to you, I, I found a 2006 article that I believe is the right one. Yes, that is it. Okay. So yep. I was able to post that. Yes. Uh, one, maybe we can have time for another question. Um, one was a comment, actually, that I'll share with you that is not a surprise to you. Uh, the participant said that if you have a drug felony, you are not allowed to be admitted into college. However, sex offenders can. Uh, so talking about the, the different rules and policies. Mm, I don't uh, know if that's true about being admitted profession. to college. I think it's true. It might be. Tr I don't know about that. I yeah. know that there's a thing about housing with that, and I know there's a whole thing about getting scholarships uh -huh. or I, getting federal funding. Federal funding, but I don't know about admission. Yeah, uh, but I think the point she was trying to, or he was trying to make, was also talking about the different rules and policies and the different impacts they have yes. on your. Partner. Yes, there's a lot of differential policies, and and you know. It's like I was saying about the housing one, that somehow it's more horrible to have a drug offender in housing than to have someone who committed a murder. Um, you know, I mean, really. So it's that war on drug stuff that has really distorted things. Absolutely. Another question just came in, which is, in California State Prison, what are you seeing as a pre release program at this time with all the drug programs throughout the state being pulled from the prison system? <laughs> uh, well, I, let me put California this way. California is called CDCR, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And as a friend was describing it to someone the other day, she said it's CDCR, but the R is silent. We're missing rehabilitation in California. Uh -huh. um, so what's happening is there's some emphasis now on funding in communities for reentry. There's money going there and different communities are using it differently and developing different programs. But they have terminated the drug programs within the prison. However, a new RFP just went out, and those proposals are due, I think, the middle of May, that they're going to put drug programs back in the prison again. So they took them all out a couple of years ago. Now they're putting them back in again. No comment. <laughs> uh, and another question just came in. Uh, just for everybody who's listening, there was some clarification about the uh, different prohibitions based on different charges and uh, higher education, which really, I think, was what Stephanie said mm -hmm. about getting uh, federal students. It's about, it's about, yeah, it's about um, if you've had a drug charge, getting, um, getting grants, and particularly getting, it used to be that you could get a grant 
uh, if you were in prison, you could get some educational grants, Pell Grants, while you were incarcerated so you could do college courses. And that program was suspended. And my now, some states you still can take college courses, but there's no federal money available. And my understanding, and I don't know if this is an urban myth or not, is that the very day that the Pell Grants were no longer available to incarcerated people, a study, a huge study came out saying the single most significant factor in successful reentry was education. Exactly. Yeah. So, so let's terminate the thing that's working. Okay, we're just, we're winding down. So let's see, one last question here. If you use an evidence-based risk assessment, can you assume that the women are not overclassified? Uh, no. Depends on if it's a risk assessment designed for women. The evidence-based risk assessments that are used in most prisons are based on men. They're evidence-based. And there's been a huge to-do about that. And if you go online to the National Institute of Corrections, you will see the trailers that have been developed to add on to those evidence-based risk assessment tools because, in fact, they overclassify women. Could you just briefly say what overclassify means for people? Overclassified who means that, that if I'm a level four prisoner, that means I might be able to come out of my cell one hour a day. If I'm a level two prisoner, I might be able to be able to be in programming five hours a day. So the level you have determines what your housing unit is, how much time you're out of your cell, what kind of programs you can sign up for. Um, and so your classification is, is uh, your classified on a level, one, two, three, four, according to your risk, your risk of, of danger, safety, and reoffending. And so now there, um, and for, that means for men, you might go to a level one, two, three, or four prison. You know, our super max prisons are level fours. However, most women's prisons have all four levels of women in them because most states only have one or two women's prisons. And so then it means within that prison, there are different restrictions according to your level. So it's not a good idea to be overclassified if, in fact, you're not a risk. But when they use risk assessments based on men, the women get overly classified and higher, too high a classification. And there is research on that for sure. Maybe we can do a webinar on this at some point. Yep. Well, in the interest Pat of Pat Van Voorhis, you want Pat Van Voorhis yes, for that? One. Yes, indeed. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, even though we weren't able to get to all the questions, and I do apologize for that, I would like to wrap up. Um, Stephanie, do you have any last words that you would like to leave the group with? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Um, I think. Um, I think we each have something we can do. And I think that every interaction we have with each other uh, needs to be as peaceful and nonviolent as possible. And I think that every action and interaction we have with a woman who's been incarcerated needs that. And she needs our respect. And she needs to feel like somebody cares. And it makes a huge difference to women who feel forgotten. Oh, really nice parting words. Uh, Carrie, before we get off, is there anything else you need or want to add? No, I just wanted to thank both you and Stephanie. It was a fantastic webinar, and thank everybody for joining us today. All righty. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Until next time. Thanks. Right, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. And Carrie, do you want us to stay on, or do you want us to get off? Did we lose Carrie? Very nice job. Thank you. Very Did you nice get what job. you needed? Yeah, yeah. Good. And it was really interesting, the chat stuff. Really? I mean, people, are pro people are still on, just so you know, so they, are, yeah. they can hear us. Um, but, yeah, it was very interesting. I, it, people are right now saying, great job, great job, great info, thank you. It was, yeah, I think it was really great. Okay, um, good. Yeah, and it, it's just, it brought together, I think, a really unique, not unique, but an interesting group of people because I think a lot of the community-based domestic violence and sexual assault programs and state domestic violence 
people. It's quite an folks. interesting mix of people. Yeah, also. aren't usually in the mix with right. those other folks. And so I just think this, I mean, I think part of what we're doing right now is really helping to bridge those groups. And I just think it's really important. Right. And, you know, all this trauma-informed uh, stuff is being so pushed in the... I know without people even knowing what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, uh, think it, they think it often means buy a curriculum and run a group. Yeah. And it's much bigger than that. Yeah, and so I just think that the more people can have broader context for it, the right. more information, the better. So, so I don't know what Terry just did, where she went. Maybe she just had it with us. I mean, <laughs> she had so much time with me. <laughs> well, she made it work, and that's oh the key God. piece. I mean, it's the technology. If the technology doesn't work, then you're really in a mess. But I think we don't need to keep you at all. The okay. question is whether or not um, I what I what I will do is save the the you know anything interesting in the chat. I will okay. send it on to you. Okay. Um, and I think I think I mean that one study I did get the uh, Messina and Grella site. It you have it a 2005 date in the sli on the slide, but I, I could only find a 2006. Oh, I think it's 2006. Thing. Okay. I All think right. it's 2006. What journal is it in? Remind um, me. I don't know. I got it off. Let me see if I can get back. I'll there. know if I remember the journal, but I think it's it's I think it's a I think it's an 06. So it's wrong in the slide. Okay. I it looked like it. I think I got it from one of your articles actually. Yeah. So, so <laughs> well, I'm assuming we will, that I will it. look and it up. It sounded like the right site. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was the American Journal of Public Health. That's it. Yeah. American Journal Childhood of Public Health. Trauma and Women's Health Outcomes. Okay. Do you want a copy of that paper? I no. The guy wanted the site, so I gave him the. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure it was the right site. Yep. So. And I'll look up the one about three times greater in childhood and eight times in adult life one. It's a it's a UCLA study about the difference between men and women in in prison and their rates of abuse. That A stuff is so. Um. Uh, you know. I mean. 10 out of 10 for the, most of the women we know. Right? Oh, I know. In fact, I was interested in when the people put up their hands that not more people put up their hands for four or more for the people they worked with. I just figured they weren't answering the question. I, I think people, some people are having a hard time following it. Yeah. And then because you could see then they were putting it in on on the chat, actually. They were answering it on okay. the chat. So, uh, I was not looking at all that. And then somebody was like, you know, how do you score, you know, that kind of, what was question three? So we were, I, we were filling that. Oh, I so, see. So that yeah. wasn't so simple. I thought I, I thought it was simple enough, but maybe yeah. it wasn't. No. So that, that's just something for us. Well, to there's, a webinar. We, but I used the show of hands. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you did. I used a little interactive item. You do. There's still 115 people on it, so that's very weird. Amazing. But, uh, and then the last question that we didn't get to, and it yeah. was, and it came in very, very late, and it was too big a question to ask at the end, is how is the ACE assessment used, meaning what are the next steps after the assessment? Well, different people have done different things. Yeah. The ACE study, when it was originally done, they did a follow